And it was concerning the sale of indulgences by the Catholic Church. Now, Luther saw this as a corruption of the gospel. Why this focused attack on indulgences? And how did that impact the Reformed thinking on law and grace? Mm -hmm. I think the reason such a big chunk of those theses were, were focused on indulgences and, and abuses um, first of all, the, the notion of the indulgence was something that you would buy, mm -hmm. um, and uh, in, in I mean to, to sort of boil it down, really, it was about buying grace. It was about buying forgiveness. It was about uh, uh, accruing merit, um, and so uh, for Luther, and I think for anybody who would want to take scripture seriously. That obviously, first of all, undermines the sufficiency of the atoning death of Jesus Christ. I think that was a f the fundamental offense of the idea of buying merits, of buying grace, of buying uh, favor. That somehow you could add to the, uh, the, the, the all-sufficient work, atoning work of Christ at the cross. Um, and of course, along with denying uh, the, the, the sufficiency of Christ's atoning work at the cross, it undermines the role of faith, that our salvation is by faith and it's through grace. Uh, because if, if I actually need to buy an indulgence or, or I'm able to buy, um, acquire grace or buy grace by um, uh, paying for it or by through saints or some other personage like Mary, um, then actually faith and grace become far less central. They may still play a role, uh, but it's not grace alone mm -hmm. and faith alone uh, and Christ alone anymore. It's Christ and, it's faith and, it's grace and. And so that was a, a fundamental um, offense to Luther. Um, and another thing that it does, of course, is instead of Jesus Christ becoming the um, being, I should say, the source of all power and all authority and, and being the, the, the power center, if you will, of the Christian gospel, um, the church institute, mm -hmm. if the church is to enrich itself on selling grace, uh, then of course, the dispenser of salvation is a, is a human institution. And that institution makes itself rich, uh, enriches itself on the basis of selling grace to the people. So there's also there not just a denial of the sufficiency of the atonement or the sufficiency of faith and grace, but there is a shift of the center of, of power and authority from Christ himself as the head and Lord of his church to a human institution, to, to, the, to the church institute uh, that is able to sell you uh, grace, which of course centers all the power uh, and indeed the money mm -hmm. uh, in the church institute. And that too was an offense to the reformers. But, uh, the, but the reformers saw that there was, a, well, there was a great danger that not only was the, the way of salvation being undermined by these indulgences and abuses, uh, but the church institute itself uh, as an organization, um, because of course the church uh, uh, with sinful human beings in it and, and fallible sinful leaders uh, within it, um, would become the power center uh, because it is the dis then effectively the dispenser of grace and salvation, which is it's only Jesus Christ who brings salvation. Um, so, uh, and of course, uh, to, to pay for that on top, mm -hmm. to actually then be able to acquire this grace or this indulgence uh, through money uh, is a fundamental denial uh, of the gospel and of the sufficiency of Christ's work. So they, th those abuses had to be attacked. And to be fair to uh, um, many within the Church of Rome, there were many that recognized this. Mm 
-hmm. that these were abusive, uh, that these were an abuse of power. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the Counter-Reformation in many respects sought to try and deal with many of those uh, abuses. So, uh, in some respects there, I'm not sure that Luther was saying something that was all that um, shocking or controversial to the average person who looked at what was going on in, 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 in Rome um, and beyond and thought, what has happened to the church? Where is it? Where is the true church of Jesus Christ? One interesting observation is that the idea of the indulgence itself probably originated in the notion of restitution, hmm. which is an aspect of God's law, of course, and probably the most famous incident that we see in the Bible is Zacchaeus hmm. uh, in, through the ministry of Jesus making restitution, going over and above in making restitution what the law required of him, uh, because um, the fruit of repentance uh, from sin is that as far as is possible in the human relationships that we're in that, that we make restitution. So, uh, you know, him that steals, steal no more uh, and seeks to restore what has been stolen. And, we, and uh, when this happens in Zacchaeus' case, Jesus says, you know, salvation has come to this house. Mm -hmm. uh, so probably the indulgence is in a sense a, a perversion of the, the good practice of uh, making restitution where possible in our relationships one to another. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for example, if I had stolen, you know, $250 from you and I came and said, oh, I'm, I'm really sorry, please forgive me. Uh, it would be quite legitimate for you to say, um, I, I do, do want to uh, forgive you. Um, are you able to restore the $250? Uh, that you stole. And that would be a fruit of repentance, that the, the repentance is real. So it does raise the question of this relationship between uh, law and grace. And I think for the reformers, uh, the issue was that the law of God, would, they had a high view of God's law. I mean, if you look at Calvin and uh, 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 Beza and um, many of the reformers that followed them, uh, Luther too, to an extent, but especially Calvin, they had a high view of God's law, uh, that God's law was important in the Christian life. It wasn't seen as the source of life, that is Christ, but it was seen as the way of life, the way of righteousness. This is the way, walk in it. Um, so to seek to be obedient to God's law word was not seen as a denial of grace by the reformers, certainly by uh, Calvin, the great theologian of the Reformation, no, to, 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 to be conformed to the image of his son, Christ, who was living Torah, he was the truly obedient son, he was the one who fully obeyed God in every detail. We are being conformed to his image for the Reformers, and therefore we are, of course, by God's Holy Spirit, by grace and because of grace, being enabled to walk in terms of obedience to God's word. So um, uh, Paul, the apostle, asks, you know, do, by faith, do we make void the law? Absolutely not. We uphold the law. I mean, he tells us the law is, is good. It's holy. Uh, it, it's the issue. The problem is our sin. So grace comes in because we're all lawbreakers. I mean, the, the, the Bible defines sin as lawlessness. Uh, the reformers understood that. So they recognize that grace, the grace of God in Christ is necessary because we violate God's law. But it would be very strange indeed if we were given grace in order that we could, could conti should continue to deliberately violate God's law. Mm -hmm. No, grace is given by the Holy Spirit. And this is the nature of the new covenant. Jeremiah 31, Hebrews 8, that the law is now has a new location. It's no longer in on tablets of stone in the Ark of the Covenant. The new location of the law is in the heart, and therefore it is grace that makes us want to fulfill God's righteousness, God's holiness. It becomes our delight and our desire um, that by the Holy Spirit we live and walk in terms of God's righteous law. And then we come to God's table weekly, uh, and or 
some less frequently, but we come to the Lord's table and there uh, we renew covenant with God. We confess our sin, our violations of his law, and we find grace. Um, but the idea that we would dispense with law is a, is a nonsense because why would we need to come to God's table for grace if law no longer played a part in the Christian life? If God's holiness and righteousness in it, uh, no longer played a part in the Christian life once you were a Christian. Mm -hmm. So that's why we, Calvin called the Lord's table a means of grace mm -hmm. uh, because it was where uh, grace, uh, the covenant life is renewed uh, week by week as we come to the Lord Jesus. So uh, the relationship is an intimate one between law and grace, but we're not buying grace. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I make restitution or when, it, when we make restitution one to another because of our sins and failures, we're not buying forgiveness or buying grace. We are simply demonstrating that grace has done its work in us and that the Holy Spirit is at work within us. And so my sins are cleansed, they're washed away. And the Holy Spirit, you know, as we say in the, uh, in the Anglican book of common prayer, um, uh, when we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then we pray that we may walk in newness of life, mm -hmm. having confessed our sins to the glory of your name. So, uh, and of course, the, the service begins with the, the confession of um, the Lord Jesus Christ said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Lord, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. It's part of the, the, the Book of Common Prayer, that great reformed uh, statement of the faith and uh, service book that was used in England for, for, for many, many years. So there is an intimate relationship in an ongoing way. And the reformers, especially Calvin, sought to work that out. So in, in rejecting indulgences, that wasn't a rejection of God's law, nor was it a rejection of making restitution. It was a rejection of any notion that there's anything in us that we can bring to God that contributes to our salvation. It's all of grace. And it's this grace which transforms us to live uh, in terms of obedience to God's word as the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, and that is, as the Apostle James tells us, the law of liberty. We now walk in terms of the freedom and the true joy of walking in obedience to God's law word.